Welcome to episode 14 of Interjections. On this week's episode, we recap the 3-0 win over Torino and preview the week ahead against Salzburg and Roma. Thanks for listening. Welcome back to Interjections. We finally have an interleague win to talk about. I'm your host, Andrew. I've got Irfan and Jay with me. Irfan, how you doing, buddy? Doing good. Feels good to be back in the uh, winning column and top of the table. That's right. Top of the table with a big Juve Milan game hanging in there. How's our resident Milan fan, Jay, doing? Uh, Nervous for the match. Uh, No. It's very good to have football back after what felt like a longer than usual international break. Uh, So, yeah, just very glad to have some actual football to talk about. Yeah, well, when your favorite national team goes to England and gets humiliated, it does feel like a long international break. I know that's how I felt. You could always break the boredom with some casual gambling. (laughs) Unfortunately, I'm not part of any pro sports team I'm capable of gambling on, you know what I mean? I know someone who can recommend you an app. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, All right, well, let's dive into breaking down this Torino matchup. So, like I said, finally get a victory. I thought the first half was pretty lethargic. We only had one shot on goal in the first half. That there wasn't a ton of opportunities, and really the, the best chances of the half came to Torino. In particular, there was a turnover we had deep in our half that led to Summer making what I think is a just fantastic save, kind of diving to his right, lunging to his right. So, Jay, you, you had mentioned last episode, ironically enough, that Summer hadn't really had like a 10, had a 10 degree difficulty save. I, I I don't know, curious if you think his first half save slash maybe performance in the last five minutes of the first half changed your mind on that at all? I still wouldn't say that was a 10 out of 10 save. If you look back, the I know the shot you're referring to when that guy Sek uh, went for like a far post curler with his left foot, obviously a great save, but it actually deflected off the fry, I think, so it took quite a bit of the sting out of the shot, but I don't want to nitpick, obviously, it was still an excellent save. Um and then he made another save from Pellegri's header. So he did his job. He did his job well. And that kept us in the game in the first half. So obviously no complaints. But I don't know if, I, if we really have to nitpick. Let's call it an 8 out of 10 save. <laughs> 9 out of 10. Yeah. I'll just okay. Say, well, we'll allow that. Yeah. Well, I'll just say it's interesting because the, the initial thought I had when he made that save on sack when he was trying to aim for that far corner I was thinking to myself, I'm like, if that's Handanovic, that's a goal. And I was like, you know, maybe even if that's Onana, that's a goal. Um, so I thought Summer, in terms of, like, shot stopping, did a great job there. And overall, um, you know, I wasn't the one who's super uh, kind of just average on him, but I thought he he did a, he did a good job. Um, and uh, Torino just they didn't offer that much in the first half, like you mentioned, Andrew. They were just sitting back a lot, defending with 11 behind the ball. And it was kind of a frustrating match for us, I think. We had a hard time getting too much going. So, Orphan, one of your favorite points to make is how much we struggle coming out of international breaks. I've got the stat for you. We've now played 10 games coming out of international breaks under Inzaghi, and in, including yesterday we have six wins, four losses, and zero draws. So it's... It's a thing. We don't tend to play well out of these international breaks, and it's nice to reverse course and kind of finally get a win out of one. Yeah, it's interesting. I feel like, um, yeah, that that stat doesn't surprise me. Uh, what does surprise me, actually, and this is true of, like, I think a lot of matches under Inzaghi is, like, our inability to, like, draw. I feel like, like in some cases, like, salvaging a draw is just really tough, and the fact that we've played, you know, 10 matches after international breaks 
and you know four of them are losses and then like there's no draws um i guess that's par for the course with Nzagi, but it was good to see us get a win um yesterday and after that first half also it was good that the team responded um now you could say like uh uh, some have said that it was because of the injury to Schurz, but I think it's it's it was more than that. Yes, and rest in peace to Schurz, who died on the pitch yesterday. That that was a horrible looking injury. Like he was immediately in tears. So I, the the man we pointed out as the man to watch got in basically a I don't even know if it was forty five minute shift. It was you know sometime in the first half. Now, slight side note before we get into talking about the second half and the goals. Jay, as the residence, you know, design experts, how do you feel about the white kit and blue shorts? That's not a combination we use very often. Yeah, I was mentioning, I was commenting before the match saying, where did these come from? I haven't seen us wear a kit like that in a while. You you know, I, I think it looked okay, I guess. Just uh, you'd expect us to wear black shorts because obviously Torino wear white. Uh, but... You know, wasn't bad. Looked a bit Empoli-ish, <laughs> if anything. <laughs> That's a good analogy. It is a little Empoli-ish, but I thought it looked pretty good, all things considered. It was a nice change of pace. Yeah, I agree. It was it was nice and bright. So let's talk about the second half. That's when we picked up some steam, and we really I thought the game changed when Inzaghi made a few substitutes. So Barella picked up a yellow. He was subbed off. Then Inzaghi did his wingback substitution swap that he always does. And that that was an inflection point because after he made that, I think it was a triple change, not long after we scored the first goal of the match. It was, let me just get my timeline correct here. We scored the first goal, Taram's goal, in the 56-minute mark, and the first substitution came in the 57th minute. So not not long after he made this kind of triple change, we score a goal. Irfan, what did you think of the substitutes? Because they were a little unconventional, him taking Pavar off, him taking Brell off. Yeah, it was it was interesting. Um, first of all, I don't really know what's going on with Barella, and to an extent, DeMarco also. They've just, like... DeMarco last in the last match was not particularly good. Um, and uh, Barella has just been, I don't know, very inconsistent. I don't know if it's just the national team struggles getting to these guys, but I thought the substitutions were pretty good. They worked pretty well. And uh, I, honestly, I think it's time for Inter fans to start giving Dumfries more credit. Like, the guy has done pretty well this season. Um, and I know... There's some mixed reviews on him generally among the Inter fans, but it's really hard for me to criticize him too much with his performances this year. And he set up uh, Taram pretty well, really well for that first uh, goal. And uh, Taram's finish on that goal was also really good. So I don't know, some of the concerns I think a lot of Inter fans had going into the season um, seemed to uh, be put to the side, especially in that first match, in the first goal for that match. Dumfries is getting really good at that um, kind of jerky kind of motion that he does, uh, where he, you know, he he looks like he's going to step over the ball and go out wide, but he kind of gains a a little bit of ground with this uh, kind of what what how do you describe it? It's like in boxing or something when when they fake a punch, you know, he's constantly like faking and slowly inching forward, and then he picks out. Everyone focuses on him, right? And so they don't see Taram standing behind the defensive line. And when I say behind, I mean, you know, behind uh, towards our direction, but a few meters back from the defensive line in acres of space. And then Dumfries picks him out perfectly for him to finish into the bottom corner. So I think that's how his own goal came about against, um, was it Sassuolo? But I think in a similar fashion, yeah, Dumfries is getting good at that. He's, he's finding a lot of value uh in slowly getting forward and making some space for himself with this weird kind of jerky motion that he does. Um, I will say that I think Scherz's injury did uh, play a bigger factor than the, uh, than you might have argued. I think the guy that came on to replace him was like, he reminded me of Renocchio, you know what I mean? At, at Renocchio at his worst, this, this big Georgian guy who looked like a villain from Liam Neeson's Taken. Look, he was 
just all over the shop. He was making these kind of, or he played in a way which makes coaches nervous. You know, he seemed really insecure on the ball. He was waiting too long to release the ball and things like this. So I feel like his introduction kind of threw Torino off a little bit and that coincided with us getting some fresh legs onto the pitch. And I think you put the two and two together, that's just the perfect timing for us to overwhelm them. My biggest takeaway from the match was that I felt like a couple of players kind of showed that they deserve to start the next match. And they were Carlos Augusto and and Fratesi. As you mentioned, Erfan Barella has just not been on recently. And even though his booking, you could say it was harsh, or rather there was, actually I won't say it was harsh, but look, there wasn't a foul which led to his yellow card. It was just his reaction to the ref blowing a non-foul which he overreacted to but you know that's the whole point you can't overreact there as much as it annoys you just roll your eyes and move on kind of thing and prior to that he wasn't doing much anyway I felt like and Fratesi just has this intensity he said it himself in his post-match interview he's got this he he mentioned that people had told him not to go so hard he said he doesn't know any other way just than to get in and just sprint, you know? And so on in one hand, that makes him arguably better as an impact sub than as a starter. But considering that Barella hasn't been great, I think it's time for Fratesi to get another start against Salzburg. And uh, the same goes for Augusto. He's, um, I'd always liked what I'd seen from Augusto, but I'm really appreciating his calmness now, uh, especially with DiMarco's magic seeming to have hit a bit of a down cycle the they tried yesterday to get Barella going they played him on the left for a good portion of the first half of course normally he plays on the right side of the midfield and I don't know if the thinking there was to get him on some interchanges with DeMarco allow him to create more I thought he had a few decent passes in the first half but he just continues to disappoint and he picked up a bad yellow card and immediately was substituted as, you know, that's what Inzaghi does and you can't really fault him for it. And I'm guessing they were doing that with an eye towards Salzburg later in the week. So I, I'd say I expect Barella to start in the midweek fixture. But given that the wingback position is a bit more demanding and the wingback position requires more stamina, more athleticism. We can maybe expect Augusto to get a chance against Salzburg. And I, like you said, DeMarco's magic has kind of run dry. He hasn't really created any goal scoring opportunities since his incredible volley against, I think it was Empoli. So I'd be okay if he starts on the bench. All right, and I see Miko has joined us. Miko, what's going on? Yeah, sorry, a bit, a bit late with this one, but yeah, now I'm here. Miko, much like a typical Barella performance, just didn't manage to turn it on in time. So, <laughs> yeah. So a- after Taram scores, what, what I thought was a really nice goal, by the way, g- good placement on it. It's a true, it was, it was a good finish, I thought, after a good assist from Dumfries. We kind of took control of the game. Things weren't in doubt. Irfan, talk to me about an incredible thing we saw for the second goal, which was a forward heading the ball into a net that three quarters open. We know not every forward has this capability. So it's just thoughts on Lataro's finish. Uh, it was awesome. It was great to see. Probably about as easy of a goal as anyone will ever score. Um, anyone not named Lukaku, probably. So, <laughs> and, yet was, uh... and yet he still, and yet he still failed to actually head the ball. Like, man. <laughs> yeah, I know. He shouldered, it in. he shouldered it in, which is fine. Uh, when you're on form, you're on form, and uh, you know it That's was right. good to see him get his goal. Um, he's just, you know, he's been in just amazing form, and we really, as Inter fans and as as everybody else, just really need him to continue that and not start one of those droughts. So. It was good to see him get on the score sheet. I thought in the first half, he was actually playing okay. He was doing a lot of the things that he typically does. 
but just not getting a lot of chances because there wasn't a lot of space the way Torino was defending. In the second half, you could see him be a lot more active. Um, but it, there wasn't just a lot for him in that match. So it was good to see um, him get that goal off the corner, um, you know, regardless of how he ended up getting it. I've been meaning to ask you guys, do you think he will score 25 or more goals this season? He's on 11 now after, I think, nine games, which means there are 25 league goals, that is, which means there are 29 games left for him to score 14 or 15 goals, essentially one goal every two games for the remainder of the season. His record so far is 21 goals, which he got uh, in both of the previous two seasons. Do you think he can do it, 25 or more? Well, you've got a pencil in three will. against Salernitana. Go ahead, Miko. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I think he will do it. There, there's uh, like so many goals already. Like he's uh, like a- ahead of a schedule a bit in my mind. So I think he will. Like Andrew said, we have we have the Salernitana match up there, and it's it's a home match. So I expect a few goals from Lautaro there as well. I think he will he will hit this this twenty five, maybe even thirty. I don't know that that's a bit bit of a stretch, but but over twenty five, I, I believe he will do it. Yeah, I think so too. I think over twenty five is definitely the expectation at this point. Thirty would be awesome. The only thing that worries me a little bit is, so he, he's never the first choice for penalties, right? I mean, if Hakan's on the pitch, Hakan's taking the penalty. Um, it'd be nice if he got a couple of penalty goals, but I, I just, I'm not sure. A, I don't think he's that amazing at them, right? I don't think he has a great record, but I don't, I might be wrong. Um, but Hakan seems to be like the guy who steps up and takes the penalties, which I'm totally okay with, but that might be the yeah, difference. It's, it's Hakan by merit, right? you know? Yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's not just the way, I mean, Lataro did score that penalty against Ellen Etano. I can't remember if Chalinoli was on the pitch no, I think it he wasn't. came for Aslani. Yeah, he um, wasn't. That. Yeah, I, I don't think Latara's penalty record is is great. It's I think he's like a he's only scored like somewhere between two thirds to three quarters of his penalties, and you know it might sound like it's still obviously a positive record. It's not like Sanchez who scored four and missed eight in his career, but um, <laughs> you know it's still it's, it's still a bit too much of a you know the the missed penalties is still a little bit too high, and I can't. It's not just the fact that he puts him in the net. It's just the way he puts him in the net. Uh, you remember his penalty against Juventus in the Super Copa last uh, two seasons ago when he just buried it into the absolute corner of the net at full pace. That's the kind of technique and just the the masterful skill he has when striking these dead balls, you know. And he's obviously just a more technical dead ball specialist than Lautaro. So there's really no reason to to change things up unless you know it's like the last game of the season and you know we wanted to we want him to pad his stats or something like that the last time an interplayer scored more than 25 goals i think was icardi in 2017 2018 when he scored 29 i don't know i can't remember what lukaku's record was i don't think he ever scored more than 25 but it'll be i mean it, it doesn't happen often that people score over 25 goals and even though as Miko said, he got off to such a good start that he's like way ahead of schedule. Uh, yeah, I, I do feel like he'll stop around that, around that mark, 24, 25, to be honest. Above that is really hard to imagine. Yeah, that pen, um, uh, not not being the fir- first one to take the penalties, that's a, that's a good point that that might h- hinder this, this call tally in the end, but... I believe he he will do it. He will do it because we we are we are just scoring so many goals, and he he is so important for this team that uh, he he will play most of the minutes anyway. <laughs> I think that he will be, be there and he end up scoring enough goals. But let's see. It's be it's gonna be interesting to see what's gonna happen. Yeah, I mean the <laughs> the fact that we have Arnautovic and. Uh... And Sanchez as the third and fourth strikers means that uh, Latar will probably get 
ample playing time and and ample starts. So it'll be interesting, but I I think he'll definitely have the opportunity to do it. And like Miko said, we are a uh, we are a fast attacking team. Like we we tend to score a lot of goals and we tend to score a lot of goals in bunches. So we'll see. You know who scored on the weekend? Please tell me. Young Saar scored for our under 19s. Uh, also, in this area against Real Madrid, but I digress. <sighs> Give Young Saar a chance. The The movement lives on. I just did a f- quick fact check on you, Jay. Since the 89 Scudetto, we've had two players score 25 or more league goals. Sorry, Icardi. three players. Claudio and Ibrahimovic. And Ronaldo as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's your three. If he can clear the 25 goal mark, he'll be in kind of rare company. But yeah, Icardi does have the single season record since the kind of modern era, I'll call it. I remember a season where Higuain got 36 or something and Immobile got over 30 once or twice, but it really, really doesn't happen that often. So look, at it. If, if he does it, it'll be a huge achievement. So yeah, I'm, re- I'm really hoping he can... You can ride on this wave of good form and yeah, carry us to a title on the way. But let's not uh, get ahead of ourselves. This really harkens me back to our Syria preview episode of Interjections, where this wonderful podcast we have, no one predicted Lotaro to win Cap and Canieri. We had one Liao votes, two... I, th- I think for <laughs> was, was it Naka and then I think Miko. Who did you have? Was it Osaman? Yeah, I think I had Osaman. Who voted for Liao? Uh, I wonder who. I think it was the resident Milan fan. So as you can see, if you want high quality, poor, you know, probably incorrect pr- predictions, keep tuning into interjections, and we'll scratch that itch for you. I'm going oh, you know to pick the Torino win as well. <laughs> me, sorry, a win at Torino, I mean. How many have any of us thought we'd win at Torino? I, I think I predicted a win on this one. I th- I'm sure Miko did. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. think everyone did except you, Che. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the most shocking part of yesterday for me was, and I think it's well established on this podcast, that player name pronunciation is not my strong suits. I've been calling this guy Lazaro for the best part of, you know, five years since we signed him. And apparently it's actually Lazaro? Something like that? Uh, The the commentator (laughs) in my match was not saying Lazaro. Anyway, that that was a bit shocking. (laughs) The the commentator was saying uh, Lazaro, like putting more emphasis on the first. Yeah. I was like, what? Although those those are hit or miss because I remember there was a game last season where the the same guy was pronouncing Gosen's last name as Gusens and I was like messaging the German members of our forum saying is this actually right like this does not seem right to me so anyway don't don't try to All detract right. from your uh, reference to uh, internationale okay <laughs> I still I'm struggling to live that one down it's just I'm just you know a white you know privileged american trying my best to it, it, assimilate even myself a few minutes, in language even a few minutes ago you said capo canieri instead of capo canonieri look guys i'm not <laughs> pretending i'm an <laughs> italian expert just because i have an italian last name you know what i mean it's it is what it is just say Cali um, over and over again <laughs> cagliari <laughs> Yeah, I'll do. I'll do full British Cagliari. Um, <laughs> all right. Any, any final thoughts on Torino before we move on to the Salzburg match? Uh, I gotta say that um, I didn't watch the match live, so I uh, when I watch it today, I need the results. So I just try to take some notes without like actually having to follow them match so intensely as I as I usually do when I'm when I like doing it live and I don't know I saw some comments that we were like poor or or, or even shit in the first half and and then 
took it up from the from the second half but I think we were pretty good control throughout the whole match what did you guys talked about this did you did you see a lot of like negatives in our game or how was it because uh, I, I didn't see much like we didn't get Torin almost anything in my mind how did, how did you guys see it? This is a bit of a repeating this because I was a bit late, but but how did you guys see? I, I want to know. Yeah, I thought I think I made the point that um, you know as probably the second or t- ten, tending to be like one of the more positive uh, members. I I didn't think we played that that bad in the first half. I think Torino was just defending a lot, um, and they were defending, you know, in the typical Jurich fashion, like they were just all over. They were like completely camped out in their half. There wasn't a lot of space for us to operate. There was all like there was no space for us to kind of get into like any type of a transition game. So it took a lot of our kind of attacking prowess out of the equation. But you know, I thought we were we were pretty organized. We we played pretty well. We didn't give them that much. Um, Summer made that really good save. We talked about that, uh, and that was a really important save and one that you know my initial thought was that you know Handanovic doesn't make that save maybe even Onana doesn't make that save so I thought overall in the first half it kind of went as expected I don't think we were poor but I don't think we were you know that great either we didn't come out with a ton of energy um but I thought it was it was like serviceable I wasn't in panic mode after that first half I don't know if Jay Andrew if you guys were you got to say Torino has scored six goals in nine matches and they haven't scored for four consecutive games, so it's you know it, w- it would have been pretty bad for us to concede. Um, yeah, I agree that we didn't like the chances they got were not like systematically created or from any likewise any systematic errors on our end. Just some odd uh, odd moments here and there, like a slightly misplaced pass or whatever, but. I didn't think we were particularly great in the first half. I thought we were just really lethargic, as you said. Um, but, you know, a- as we know, a football game is not just the first half alone. And sometimes and sometimes it does come to bite us in the ass. But generally, I do think we are pretty happy to bide our time and wait for the opponent to tire a bit. I think Inzaghi somewhat relies on that to an extent. And... Now that we have players like Augusto on the bench and, uh, well, Quadrado uh, and Fratesi, etc., we can bring some speed and some intensity off the bench as well, which is something we didn't have much last season. So I think this season, more than last, we have a tendency to let the opponents kind of tire out and just wait uh, patiently and not exert ourselves too much. In the first half, uh, that is, you know, unless we score, obviously. But yeah, I, th- I think we have that that kind of card up our sleeves. So I'm trying not to get too upset or too annoyed if we don't play well in the first half, knowing that we're probably going for like a you know a late uh, push, which is exactly what we did in this game. Yeah, uh, I noticed the same thing that we 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 kind of keep kept our our end pretty in good control that like you Jay said pretty well they they didn't um, got any chances by any system system <laughs> with, with, with their system it was more like uh, I think it was Mikitarian who played pretty weakly in our zone uh, our defensive zone and they um, he gave like ball away two times in a short period and that's why what was the guy who, who got the great sick. opportunity to, yeah sick he got, got the opportunity to shoot but Sommer got this nice save out of that other than that uh, uh, they didn't have they didn't have anything else than that maybe one good header was it in the first half maybe yeah from was. I agree they had a, they had a shot from yeah. Richie that went that was like super powerful, but it went straight down the middle, thankfully. Yeah. Um, for me, final uh, thoughts on the game uh, is that I got to give credit to DeFry again. I thought he had a really, really strong game. And 
Not that a Cherby has been bad or anything, but right now between the two, I would prefer DeFry uh, start to reclaim that starting spot in the middle of the defense. You know, he's made a really good turnaround this season uh, compared to the last couple of seasons, obviously. And so, I mean, you know, baby steps, small steps at a time, but I want him to start again against uh, Salzburg. And yeah, hopefully we can settle on having a... Uh, I'll say we, I'd hope we can settle on DeFry because I do think he's a better passer than than uh, a Cherby. And I think that DeFry in form, if he can ever, you know, recapture that like 2019 form is, you know, a better defender than a Cherby, full stop. So if we can reclaim him or if he can rather kind of rediscover himself, then, then we've got another asset on our hands. So, so yeah, happy to see him uh, continue his, his rehabilitation and hopefully Inzaghi will continue to, to reward him for that. Yeah. Yeah. Good on DeVry. Uh, before we move on, Miko, one thing I think we all kind of were in, in agreement with, but I wouldn't be surprised if you disagree, which is um, I, something's up with Varela. He just – he doesn't seem like himself on the pitch. Even yesterday, I don't think he played particularly well. Um, so I, I, I don't know if you have any thoughts on Varela and DeMarco, to be honest. They, they both, like in the last couple of matches, have been pretty – pretty average not what you would expect yeah yeah that, that's true uh, n- neither of those guys are like having having a particularly great time i think part of why barrel is in such a great at great form is because um i think he's doing a lot of uh work like pretty down low in our end that he isn't attacking that much or he's like taking duties uh, just to control the play down low but then that's part of his job so I think he he should like pick up his game a bit and may, maybe this this kind of pressure from Fratesi if Fratesi could get get like few few starts here and there maybe that that should put some pressure to Barella although I, I think that Inzaghi trusts Barella uh, 100% and Barella is gonna start all the key matches anyway but I think he, he needs to pick up pick it up a bit but maybe, I like maybe the yeah. betting is the the scandal is uh, affecting him a little <laughs> bit even though you know we're presuming innocence obviously and he came out and um, you know, basically called them clowns and said that he's going to pursue legal action and all this stuff on Instagram. Uh, I think a day before the game, so you know, uh, there's probably a bit of stress on his mind. It's not like him to to lash out on social media. You know what I mean? Yeah, hard, hard to say. Hard to say what's the, what's the real reason. But yeah, for for De Marco, yeah, I think he's he's been a bit weak as well. His, his crosses are like all over the place. He, uh, they are like two, two well taught crosses anyway. And uh, I think it it seems a bit that his his game is a bit lazy time to time when when he should like track back or or come back to to give give option option for the pass and so on. Uh, so. Uh, for DeMarco, it's it's great, or or for Inter, it's great that we have Augusto on the bench because then we can just put DeMarco on the bench and bring in Augusto because he's been pretty good almost always when he's came in from yeah. the bench. I, I, I can't. I like I Augusto can't, a lot. Sorry, I was just gonna say I can't understate how much of a impact, or rather, how much of a factor it is that Augusto is. 10 centimeters taller than DeMarco and probably 10 kilograms heavier as well. He just looks so much more physically imposing. He's not letting people get past him because he can muscle them off the ball, you know, and his winning headers that DeMarco can't even dream of reaching. And I really like having that physical presence in the box, even if he is, you know, a bit less nimble, a little bit less agile than DeMarco. I think maybe DeMarco is just gotten a little bit complacent you know what i mean he's obviously in a great spot right now 
He's playing in the national team. He's the starting left back for his uh, for the club he's supported since he was a child. So, you know, if, if you look at it that way, he's exactly where he wants to be. He's, he's enjoying a great moment in his life and in his career. But those things can probably lead to a little bit of complacency as well, you know. So, yeah, uh, yeah, that, keep someone yeah. like, yeah, Augusto kind of nipping at his heels and remind him that he can't take that for granted. Yeah, that that's what I've also thought, um, uh, like been thinking that maybe that's the that's the reason that he's been been slacking a bit in a sense. Yeah, but, I mean, he's but, he's being linked with like Manchester City, and you know he's getting a lot of attention. So I could see that as being you know maybe a factor in his psyche, even if he's he is a consummate professional. We have no reason to think otherwise, but. I, I, do you guys think we'll ever see? I mean, I know we've talked about this a little bit about how important Mkhitaryan is, but you think we'll ever see a Fratezi, Barella, Hakan midfield, or you think it's just it would it even work? I don't know. I, I I'd be curious to try a few things to maybe free up Barella a little bit more. I'm not sure if starting um, Fratezi would do that. Maybe it might be Klassen that might help that, but I don't know. It's just. Something needs to change with that guy. He needs to be a lot more effective. Yeah, it's, yeah, I don't know. It's tough. Oh, go on. No, I was saying it, it's tough to. I, the the thing about that midfield combination, be worried about is the defense a little bit. And I love Fertese's energy, but I don't think he's particularly gifted like tackling or like ch- challenging directly opponents to win the ball back. So I do worry that. Barella, he's taking a more defensive responsibility, but I don't think he's been very strong defensively either. He's prone to dumb challenges. He's prone to picking up yellow cards. Mkhitaryan's been surprisingly good defensively for us. He 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 does well to win the ball back. He does well to kind of relieve pressure by finding these pockets of space the way Fortezi maybe can't. I don't know. It. I do get worried about the midfield a little bit because... We're able to play our game when you play against a team like Torino, who doesn't pressure you. Torino didn't press us much at all yesterday. But when we get into these games against the likes of, I don't know, Atalanta, Juve, and they're going to push higher up the pitch, I don't know. I I just get nervous about changing up things in the midfield too much because I worry that we're going to be setting ourselves up for failure, losing the ball, then having to defend immediately, which just aren't our strengths let's transition to the Salzburg match so Salzburg midweek Champions League fixture on Tuesday they Salzburg have they beat Benfica in the first match after Benfica had a man sent off and then they lost pretty handedly to Sociedad if you were to pick a game of our four remaining Champions League group stages and say you know, what's the must win? I think the home match against Salzburg is probably it's This is the easiest match remaining. Salzburg might be the weakest team squad-wise in the group. So it, there's really no excuse here, in my opinion, to drop points. You have... <laughs> I don't know if any of you guys watch the... I, I'm, like, not a preseason football guy. Like, I try not to watch those matches. But I did watch the highlights of our rain-soaked 3-3 draw against Salzburg in August, where it was like a monsoon and the pitch was unplayable. So maybe we're in for some goals on Tuesday. I don't know. But Miko, any thoughts on Salzburg? Do you agree that this is the easiest remaining fixture on our Champions League group stage docket? Yeah, absolutely. I thought it would be the away game because now we are playing like two two games in a row at home. But yeah. Apparently it is indeed the home match, but yeah, yeah, this this should be like like the Benfica match in terms of like like total control of the match or, or like the Benfica match second half. I think we should like come come with our, all guns blazing right from the start and and just score a few goals. I, I can't see why we <laughs> wouldn't be able to win this match pretty convincingly if, if we can't then <laughs> we are in trouble uh, yeah th- there's no no excuses here what what what's going to be interesting for me is the rotations 
a, a bit regarding the Torino match as well as Bavar was taking off and was ta- was taken off and and so on to run played the whole match. I'm I'm curious who's gonna start this match and how how the how the minutes are gonna get like handled or managed bit between for example the Salzburg match and then the uh, Roma match next week and it's gonna be interesting. I said it before a- and I'll, I'll say it again here. I think the coach needs to to push uh, and just not really worry too much about rotation here. We've got a stretch of Salzburg into uh, sorry Salzburg uh, Roma, Atalanta Salzburg again, then Frosinone at home before the international break. And I believe you guys will be at that one. Uh, but that's the game where you rotate. Until then, you have to rotate uh, very strategically and minimally, I believe. So I think, or I like to think that Pavard coming off yesterday was, uh, so th- that meant Damian played 90 minutes. And I think, well, like I said, I, I like to think that's because Pavard will start again against Salzburg. And same with Dumfries, uh starting on the bench yesterday that's because hopefully he's they're planning for him to start against Salzburg and Salzburg look weaker to me than they have in previous seasons this they've dominated the Bundesliga for quite some time this season still early days of course but they're second place by four points trailing against Sturm Graz and they don't have as many like I mean, normally when you look at the Salzburg team, you see a handful of kind of highly rated youngsters and, you know, uh, players who inevitably go on to, to to bigger teams, right? But I'm finding that there's less of those kind of players this season, at least. And, I mean, Salzburg lost yesterday at home to Lask. So I think... I think it should be fairly straightforward in the Champions League. We have to just, as Miko said, go out there, assert our dominance early, and basically just not give them any sight on goal. We want to be positive, and I think we want to press up high as well, probably. Uh, make sure we just kind of suffocate them and just really assert our dominance. Yeah, this is an opportunity where you want to be the one initiating, you want to be the one, tra- like, like a... I don't know, like a boa constrictor, just kind of sapping life out of its prey. You just want to take a stranglehold on this game. And I don't think Salzburg is going to be able to play a high-pressing style of football against us at San Siro. And if even if they try to, they won't be able to sustain it. I think that bodes well for us. We tend to play pretty well against teams who sit back. So... Really no excuses here, in my opinion. It sh- should be a pretty comprehensive win. The the one starting lineup decision, I just I don't want to see Sanchez start. I think it's very important that we give Taram and Lataro the start. Let's get a couple early goals. Let's finish this thing early. Then you can worry about rotations. The, the, the team will have four or five days to get ready for Roma. There's no need, since it's a Tuesday fixture... There's no need to get cute here. Let's let's play the best starting eleven possible. Let's get a couple early goals and let's put this thing to bed. Let's not screw around and have Sanchez playing as our defensive midfield striker for sixty minutes, and then we're struggling to break away. And then we have to break glass in case of emergency and put Taram on the pitch. So, hoping and Zaghi fields the best eleven possible. And to Jay's point, I think we're going to see Dumfries start just based on what the substitution pattern was yesterday against Torino. Yeah, I don't want to see. Uh, I don't want to see Sanchez starting. Uh, it's, it's it never particularly works out that well. Um, I also think that as important and as kind of perfunctory of a win as this seems to be, I also don't want us to like take it for granted and try to like skate by. I think you know. Inzaghi needs to maintain the the intensity and maintain the focus and put the best team that we can out there. Uh, and Taram just, the guy, even when he's not scoring, he pressures the defense in a way that none of our other players really can. So there's a lot of like intangible benefits to having him on the pitch. 
um, that Sanchez maybe used to be able to do, but at least so far this season and lately in his career generally, we just haven't seen with any consistency. So, yeah, I think that Taram Lataro partnership is extremely important, even for a match that seems like it should be an easy win. It's still the Champions League. There's no such thing. And so we got to keep uh, we got to keep that intact. And Dumfries, I agree, would be a great start. Um, he's been he's been really good, and I expect that to continue. I also expect Demarco to have a bit of a bounce back game. He usually does pretty well in the Champions League. He's 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 up for it. He's he's excited. So I think he'll be a little bit better than he has been in the last couple of matches. All right. I, I really don't think there's much more to discuss with Salzburg. Hopefully, it's a nice, comprehensive win. If it's not, we'll be the first ones to podcast complaining about it, so you can look forward to that, but hopefully to win. I, I want to spend more time talking about our next league match. We have, like, man, this is brutal. When you look at the upcoming league fixtures, next five matches in the league, we have... Roma, Atalanta, Frosinone, Juve, and Napoli. This is a brutal schedule. So it all starts off at home against Roma next weekend. Roma, about 30 minutes ago, picked up a victory over 10-man Monza, thanks to a 90th-minute goal from El Shirari. It was not a pretty game for Roma, but they got the three points, and that's kind of what Mourinho does. It's not They're just not pretty games. Jay, I know you have the strongest feelings on this, so maybe before we talk about the return of, turn of Lukaku, what are you expecting from Roma from an approach perspective in this game? From an approach perspective, I think they'll try to defend. I mean, so often football comes down to these weird, almost cosmic jokes where a former player, you know, the former player curse, like the former target curse, for example. These things are... These things shouldn't play a factor, but they they do. And last season, we were in some really bad form while they were doing okay. And on top of that, there was that whole Dybala narrative, right? And who scores against us at home to to finally break their... Because before that, they had lost, I think, a couple of consecutive games against us. But who scores at home? Uh, Of course, it's Dybala, right? And... This time, I feel like the narratives are kind of reversed. You've got us in a really good stretch of form, while Roma have had a really poor season so far. They've got an injury crisis, I believe. Um, And on top of that, there's that whole Lukaku narrative as well. So I really do think it's like a reverse of last season. And for that reason, I can see us dismantling them, I like to think. I like to think that the hostile atmosphere will play a role in negatively influencing Lukaku and hopefully uh, erode his confidence because, you know, it would just be annoying <laughs> if he scores against us, let alone if uh, he leads Roma to, to, to beat us at home, you know. Um, and more to the point, we dropped points in our last two home games that cannot continue under any circumstances. I mean, one point in two home games against Bologna and Sassuolo is, like I said, nothing short of a disaster. Those five points could come back to really hurt us. At the end of the season, we can't afford to make that, you know, seven points or whatever, you know, even more. So we really have no excuse other than to win here. Uh, And I think Roma had Mourinho sent off in this game as well. Um, Referring to the game like an hour ago against Monza, I think Mourinho was sent off. So yeah, yeah, he was sent off like <laughs> like ten ten minutes in the injury time. So he he really picked his last moment to get out of this match. This <laughs> next yeah, Vegas exactly. match, exactly. He probably do, he probably doesn't want to be blamed for when they get smashed yeah. five nil. So um, yeah. <laughs> so look, I, th- there's another reason there. They don't even have their coach on the sidelines to to guide them and give them tactical advice and all that kind of stuff. So you know. Maybe he'll pull the old uh, hide in the laundry basket move he did at Chelsea, but there's no. When you put all the factors together, we we should really just um, yeah, it, it should be a comprehensive win. Uh, I'm rarely confident of a comprehensive win, but I can see us getting 
three four in this game. Yeah, so Roma's performance in the league is just oh wow! I'm watching the Bologna Frosinone game and Bologna just scored a header from outside the box. Don't see that very often. Um, anyway, so Roma's form has perked up a little bit from a result perspective. They're, they've gotten points their past three or four league fixtures, but it's just, it's just it's so hard to watch, man. Like. It, it's gritty. They aren't creating many chances. Irfan's boy Balotti had he was scoring goals to start the season. That's kind of quieted down now. Where he's it, this is a hard team to watch play, and I feel for Mourinho because I know he's not working with lots. And as Jay, you were mentioning, I feel like Roma's always in an injury crisis. But man, it's just. There's, I feel like their style is very conducive to us winning. Because once again, this is a team who doesn't know how to take initiative in matches, and those are the teams we tend to do well against. Irfan, give me your thoughts on the Lukaku return. What, what are you expecting? Probably a hostile environment. We know Lukaku in big games sometimes tends to go missing. What do you think we're in for? Yeah, it's interesting. I, I I don't know what to expect. I mean, he's proven time and time again that, you know, when the spotlight is kind of on him, when there's adversity, he kind of shies away from it. Um, but then, you know, he we haven't really he's never really played against Inter, I don't think, and so it's gonna be it's gonna be interesting to see how it all kind of shakes out. I, I expect he'll play fine. I don't think he'll completely shrink under the pressure but i also don't think that he's particularly that good of a player the way he was for us under conte so you know i think he'll provide the usual danger but i don't suspect him to be uh, a world beater by any chance i think our defense will be ready for him um I, i'm kind of more interested to see how we react against him a lot of the players that will be playing um you know were around when he was around um, so it's, I'm, I'm curious to see kind of how our guys show up and how intense they are, given the all the media scrutiny about the way he behaved. So, you know, hopefully they have some pride and they have some backbone and they show it and they, you know, rough him up a little bit. I think it'd be nice to see them lean in a little bit on some of those tackles and just... DeMarco get... sent off for a two-footed <laughs> tackle in the first 10 minutes. Yeah, can you imagine? Uh, he was I, on... I he was on t- he was on some talk show where he said, like, he confirmed that, like, you know, um, he was close to Lukaku last yeah. season, and that, yeah, like Lukaku didn't answer the phone calls and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, yeah it's uh, just hopefully it's they keep really that out of their heads, to be honest. Yeah, I mean, I think they'll keep it out of their heads, but I think they should play with some pride. Like, I think that you know, th- this guy clearly, like, disrespected the club in a in a pretty significant way. So you would expect the the people who are playing, who represent the club, to show a little bit of you know, just professionalism. I'm not saying make him a target and, you know, get sent off or do anything stupid, but, you know, let him know you're there. Yeah, you know, yeah. Just yeah. give him a little, give him a little push, give him a little, little welcome when you can. Um, and, you know, because they can't afford to treat him like the guy who helped them win a Scudetto just like two years ago, right? It has to be a little bit different. Um, but I don't Here's know. Here's a I feel surprising like... stat for you. Sorry to yeah. interrupt. Here's a no. surprising stat for you guys. Roma mm-hmm. actually has the second best attack in the league right now. Well, I was just getting to that. I kind of feel like <laughs> you all. I kind of feel like you all are sleeping on, you know, Euro champion world beaters like Brian Cristante and Andrea Bellotti, and <laughs> I, I, I don't know like where this besmirching disrespect is coming from. But I think it's time to give Roma some due. Most <laughs> goals we, we talked about this last end. episode. They put seven past Empoli. Yeah, that's true. That's true. That's true. But look, numbers don't lie, all right? Um, (laughs) Joint second um, with Napoli, twenty goals scored, but joint uh, joint worst in the top ten with Lazio in terms of goals conceded. So, and yeah, as as Andrew mentioned, half of them are from (laughs) from Napoli. The thing I'm worried about with Lukaku is. I'm not really worried about him because, one, he hasn't really found his form yet with Rama, and two, I just think he's so weak mentally as a player that when all eyes in the stadium are going to be on him, when he's getting jeered every time he touches the ball, 
I don't think he's going to live up to the standard. The, the, the thing I do worry about with him, though, is like he is a very fast player There's when he's on. And our defense is anything but PC. I would probably still go with a Cherubi, though, man-marking him, just so we have that physical presence in the center of the defense. Like, love DeVry, but he's not someone I'd consider, like, a overly physical player. Like, he's more a f- finesse than, like, a rugged, you know, manly, just someone who's going to dominate you physically like a Cherubi. M- Miko, where would you go with this one? Would you go with Cherubi or would you go with uh, the Rye? Yeah, I, I think I would go with a Cherubi, but as you pointed out quite well that we... Or, or Insagi needs to be uh, like certain when we when we like uh, when when he plans the game plan for this match that we don't attack like too recklessly because as you said Lukaku is still relatively fast and he's strong that he can he can like fight against some of our def- defenders anyway if it's like one against one. So we need to make sure that we don't let them uh, let them fast counter counter us. But what what's interesting is who's gonna feed Lukaku in the end because Pellegrini is out and I think I think Dybala will be out as well. I saw saw some tweet from Sky Sports that that said that he's not gonna make it. So I think that's a that's a, that's a big factor for Roma that can they challenge us or not if Dybala is not there and even if he is there he is not like he's not like 100% fit anyway so that's a big big issue for them I feel Cristante Cristante is going to feed uh, feed them um <laughs> of course, Dybala not being there is gonna be is gonna be huge for us. I mean, e- even if he's hobbled a little bit, he just he has this like really annoying ability to just completely score against us, and it's it's extremely frustrating. So I'm hoping, you know, for as an Inter fan's sake, if he's not playing, that that'd be great. Um, but if he is playing, it'll it'll make things a little bit harder because he he does have that kind of quality of like creating something out of nothing which Mourinho's teams a lot of times end up depending on so that could be that could be a bit tough something to look after also on Cristante like don't you Cristante's feel like playing Mourinho... a center back oh is this playing center back they're like the same player him and Bonaventura I feel like they're exactly the same player I've never seen them both exist in the same plane together so, as far as I'm concerned, <laughs> what, are you talking about? what are you talking about? They, they complain. <laughs> what? <laughs> they, they look yeah, I, think they both, they, I think they both just started for Italy on, uh, <laughs> on Tuesday. Totally average Italian players with way too much AC Milan affiliation for my taste. Let's just put it there. <laughs> hey, ba- Bonaventure was going to be an Inter player, right? And then I think like Milan stole yeah. him away on deadline day because we failed to unload. Um, who did we fail to sell that led Sanchez. to like? Was that it? Yeah. Wait, wait, what was the question? No, I'm saying who who did we were, we failed to unload someone on deadline day in like 2016. Like we had Bonaventura lined up, but as a result, like his agent was in Milan. I was like, all right, well, I guess we'll sign for Milan instead because like we failed to un, we failed to sell someone. Oof, going back 2017, was it 16? Was it was it Condopia then or or? Uh... I don't know. I mean, who even who do we even have back then? Because uh, Is that too? too <laughs> <Man>. <laughs> that was that was early. That was pre two thousand sixteen. I don't know. I don't. I do. I do recall us being closely linked to Bonaventura when he was at Atalanta, and that he joined Milan for like twenty million or something. But I don't recall that being dependent on us offloading anyone at the time. Maybe I'm just forgetting. Get to well, your memory is tends to be pretty spot on, so I'll I'll say I'm wrong <laughs> on this one. But yeah, I, for some reason, I distinctly remember us like being very close to signing him. Yeah, I'm sure we were. Anyway. Um, but for, from what I've seen of Roma, they depend a lot on long balls to Belotti uh, and Lukaku, and the interplay between the two of them. It 
seems like somehow Bellotti is better at bringing down these long balls and playing the target man hold up role than Lukaku is. Um, and then you've got obviously Spinazzola on the left, who's still pretty good, uh, but not as. I mean, he was probably the player of the tournament in Italy's Euro victory a couple of years ago, but I don't think he's the same player since since that uh, Achilles injury, unfortunately for him. But I don't see the same, I mean, quality, obviously, but I don't see the same attacking contribution from their midfield. Uh, they've got Bove and, uh, like I said, Paredes is starting in defensive mid. Uh, and you've got the new guy, Hasim Uar from Lyon. It's a nice player there, but I don't think yet that that midfield knows how to really link up with the forward line. And so, yeah, like I said, they're relying heavily on the link-up play between Belotti and Lukaku. And look, if we can't contain Belotti, then seriously, just just pack it up. So we can, we can go around the room and do some predictions. Jay, Jay give me your match prediction. 5-0. Wow, for Roma, uh, I assume. Uh, uh, no, for for Inter, uh, I'll say Lautaro won't score, and instead we'll get goals from Turam, uh, Fratesi, uh, who will bench Barella after fifty minutes of following another shit performance. Um, <laughs> goal from Demarco, a goal from. Mkhitaryan, the former Roma player. So that's what that's four now. Um, and then a goal from the Cherby. Actually, no, no, no. All right. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Uh, Turam, Mkhitaryan, Fratesi, DiMarco, and Dumfries. There we go. Five goal scorers. Fair enough. When you said 5 0, I thought you were giving your prediction for Milan Juve this afternoon. <laughs> that's correct. Well, that, Irfan, that's what's your prediction? <laughs> uh I'm gonna go three one. Uh let's go Lotaro. I like the DeMarco pick. Let's go Lotaro, DeMarco, and then uh a cheeky goal by Aslani to 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 seal it. Three one. Who's scoring Roma's goal? Obviously it's gonna be Cristante. <laughs> not look not Lukaku. <laughs> no. Dying on this hill. Oh, <laughs> uh... All right, Miko. Um, I'm gonna go with three nil. We're not gonna like destroy them, but pretty convincingly win anyway. And the uh, goals, I would give Lautaro um, one goal, Dumfries one, and then Fratesi. That's my All right, picks. I'm, I'm gonna lock in a one nil win. I. I don't know. Just I think Rome is going to try to muck this thing up a little bit. And Zaghi doesn't tend to do well in weeks where we have both a Champions League and a league fixture. So I, I think we get the job done because Rome are so poor. But I'm not as optimistic. It's going to be comprehensive. And then just in a, to close the loop, I did some quick memory searching. So in 2014, we had agreed to sign Bonaventura. And then we, we took the deal to Mazzari, and Mazzari rejected it and said he did not want the player. So I guess for once in his life, Mazzari made a good decision. Bonaventura finally uh, realized his potential now at 35 years of age. So as you said, that's a future into player if I've ever seen one. <laughs> I think well, I saw him. Like, he scored against us, so yeah. Yeah, of course. He game. owns us, man. Like, he... <laughs> <laughs> he scored a ridiculous amount of goals against us in the past few seasons. I think I saw over the week he was like the oldest player to ever like get his debut goal for Italy. Something like that when he scored against Malta. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, no, that's real correct. Just before we wrap up. In your, real, in your real, one-nil prediction? Uh, do, do, do. I'll take for Tazy. G- give me a goal from the midfield. Before we wrap up, I'm just curious if anyone wants to opine or give any thoughts on this like Finnish billionaire who keep, or maybe multi-millionaire who keeps <laughs> talking about us in the media and who 
I don't know. That, that, Miko, perhaps you're the expert on this, but it sounds like he's pretty openly saying he wants to buy the club. But I have genuine concerns about how rich this guy actually is and how deep his pockets are. So, Miko, maybe you want to set the table for us on what exactly is going on here? Yeah, the, the first time this Ciliacus guy or, or, or this name came up, it was last spring. And I, I asked a a little leader around about this guy and and what I was told that he is, is more like an attention seeker and he don't have like capabilities to buy inter but then I don't know like I, I did these translations uh, from his interview with, which happened like last summer and then, then a few days ago, there was another interview. They, this big paper in Finland, they called him. He was at Milano at the time, and uh, and I don't know. He he talks like like he's really in it in in this this buying process, and he's 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 talking like Chang Chang is going to sell, and he he knows that, and Chang has his reasons, but. He, this um, Chiliakus won't won't tell that publicly because that's that's like a, he he doesn't wanna he do, he doesn't wanna say that but he he was he was told why why Chang want to sell and, and so on so I I don't know it's just um, the interview I, I listened it uh, he he's like a, a like a master bullshitter because he <laughs> he talks very convincingly. <laughs> about his about this case and and this like this he his um his approach to this whole whole thing that he really he really wants to he really wants to buy a football club which has a global fan base, a big global fan base so he can make make money with it that's like his his main motivation he he openly said it that he he doesn't want to he doesn't want to buy a club just because he loves football but because he he thinks that he he can make money with it so that that's that's kind of an interesting angle that says everything you need to know about him doesn't it yeah yeah but then again (laughs) yeah it's it's fascinating (laughs) angle because uh inter doesn't look like a club you can you can like make money with it in a long time, I feel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he, you have to watch his business acumen of someone who he, thinks he can make money on Inter. Yeah, and he, <laughs> exactly. he said like, he he said like he he would at least double the valuation of the club within five years. So that that was a, that was an interesting interesting take as well. But uh, as much as we follow we followed uh, all the financial. Um, like financial troubles in this club uh, at least I'm not as sufficient to say uh, how these uh, financial pro- uh, financial projections li- really look like so I wouldn't like uh, I wouldn't like automatically say that he's an <laughs> insane even if it it a bit kind of sounds like that, given given our situation financially, but I I think that he's he maybe wants to do this, but I don't know is there like any real reality to do it, because the latest was that he wants to join forces with this um, who, who's the guy the the Sheikh who wanted yeah. to buy United. Al Tani something, and uh, I don't I don't know. Does this Sheikh have any any interest doing doing such things with with some random Finnish <laughs> Finnish businessman <laughs> instead they, of they, just they should, buying the? <laughs> they should turn the fuck off. Seriously, fast them. Yeah, fast them. the fuck off. Yeah, he was like bidding for for six for six billion 
for the Manchester United. So why why would he need exactly, <laughs> this silly, exactly. silly does, guy? Why does he need this guy to? This guy is trying to yeah. attach himself to the Qatari thing because he has no money himself, and <laughs> yeah, he needs to keep. He needs to keep my club out of his fucking mouth, all right? Because no, <laughs> no serious buyer talks this much on Twitter. <laughs> it just doesn't happen. The only people who do that are the ones who are seeking attention because they they need it to make up for the fact that they don't have either a serious business acumen or because, more accurately, they don't have the money flat out. So, I think this guy is like a hard avoid at all costs. To be honest, uh, let him continue talking about you know buying the club and kind of half like vaguely supporting us on Twitter other than that like I don't want this guy anywhere near our club to be honest give me some rando shake any day and I don't care about the sports washing I'd rather take that over this this clown well I, I disagree with that but but uh, he, he said he like argumented why he would be uh, like a good good partner is that Well, he, he claim, claims that he knows how to make money with with sports or football, and he said that, or argument that that with, with this shakes money, and then his his services, whatever companies he owns, I, I haven't like look into that at all, so I, I have no idea. But Does, he, doesn't it sound kind of like <laughs> doesn't just doesn't it sound like bullshit? Though, you know what I mean? Like, oh, with your money and my skills, we can, you know. <laughs> I, yeah, I, do, I just need someone I don't to know. believe in me, you know. It just sounds very, uh, I don't know. It just sounds very sus. I feel like serious. Yeah. I feel like serious entrepreneurs are probably not. Um, yeah, don't get me wrong. Entrepreneurs need uh, that, you know, that venture capital sometimes to to fund their projects and everything. But for the most part, I don't think they're publicly, you know pretty much begging on Twitter, let me join your project and I'll do this and I'll do this and, you know, make these grandiose claims for a club which, you know, as you said, <laughs> will not be profitable for a very long time uh, in, in an economy which itself is just everything in Italy is against you, you know. That's why that Amanda Stanley, what's that woman's name? Um, the woman who was, I think, uh, working for that, The consortium PIF that took over Newcastle, she was said, she said, you know, they took a look at Italian football and just decided, fuck this, you know what I mean? Like literally everything is against you. The government is against you. The councils are against you. The broadcasting networks the are against you. Yeah, the, the local mayor Salah is against you. Um, <laughs> you know, the the fans are against you uh, because they'll hurl racial abuse at every opportunity <laughs> and they'll go on strike if you raise the ticket prices from seven euros to eight euros, you know, and this, you know, the, the economy is just not great in Italy. Uh, and so it's just such a difficult uh, environment to operate within. And I doubt that, well, I doubt that the Qataris know, you know, fully grasp that either, but I would just trust their competence to work within a difficult environment much more than this than this rando Twitter millionaire, um, especially given the fact that they have deep pockets to absorb losses for a long period. Whereas this guy doesn't sound like doesn't sound like he you know he sounds like he gets his washing done at a public laundromat. You know what I mean? So, well, it's great that you think that. It's great that you think that. But you know, from Suning's perspective. If uh, if the Qataris offer something, and you got Jeff Bezos offering something, and you got Elon Musk offering something, and this guy comes in with even one dollar more, you know they're gonna sell it to this guy, and the deal will never fall through, never fall, <laughs> never actually, you know, follow through with the deal. But that one dollar will completely make them forget about the uh, actual, uh, you know, bona fides of anybody else bidding on anything. So don't uh, put it off. Uh. <laughs> Look, Italy is a wonderful country to visit, to enjoy their food, to watch their sport on TV sometimes when it's actually available. But my God, I cannot think of many countries I'd rather le not put my money in than Italy. Like, what a waste of an investment that would be for the majority of people. Like, Zhang is the only person to be moderately successful investing as a foreign owner in Italy, minus than like Elliot, who repossessed a club. Yeah, I just want to continue with this this guy. He well, if you haven't haven't read read my my translation of this interview, you should check it in the forum. Uh, 
Uh, I'm gonna translate this later later interview as well. It was a few days ago, so I'm gonna translate it there. But uh, but his argument argument is also that or uh, he said that um, that Changs won't sell to just anyone. Well, again, he should he <laughs> it could be just bullshitting, but <laughs> but uh, he he was saying that Changs are like looking for a buyer who wants to like develop the club and like try to grow it so that's that's one one point as well oh, what so, are the qataris going to do buy the club and you know like to follow sell, sell sandwiches or something like that. like what does he think the qataris would do as opposed to or anyone would do as opposed to him any owner is gonna you know gonna develop the club yeah but but the point is that uh you know the shakes they just buy the clubs and then then uh, like do, yeah, do whatever they it's want. A yeah, it's yeah. it's a it's a bit different different thing to like the, this Chiliakus guy. He said that uh, he, he's got some shit because of these rumors of he, him buying United or Inter or whatever. And uh, every everyone is saying that hey, you don't have this kind of money. And he just said that yeah, I I don't have, but I don't I don't like need to have because it it doesn't work work that way in the business that you have this like one billion in your account and then you just buy a football club but you you get like a loan money or or investor money or whatever so that that was kind of the point that you don't need to have 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 this money you just get the investors to to get you the money and uh, maybe maybe this Qatar Sheikh is one one of the investors in in this guy's mind who, who could be part of this uh, this buying process? But but yeah, it's it's uh, as you just mentioned, he is so public in this one. Even if he tried to say that he he doesn't want to he doesn't want to say everything uh, about this, and yet he's he's tweeting and, and giving interviews in Finnish <laughs> such. So uh, I don't know. It's a it's a bit bit uh, bit strange but it's it's re- interesting as a, as a Finnish person it's, it's gonna be interesting to follow uh, will will this become anything more than just a tweet tweet fest you should you should slide into his DMs and see if you can get a uh, get a sporting director position I'm assuming there's like 50 <laughs> people in all of Finland um, and probably three inter fans so you probably have a leg up <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Me I'll, I'll, I'll try. Boys club. I'll, I'll try. I'll try. Uh, well, if you are listening to interjections and you happen to know anyone who is a billionaire and bored with their money, please contact us at interjections.pod at gmail dot com, and we'll get you in touch with the right people. That's right, Miko. We'll forward your request to Miko, who will then take it to Ziliakis on Twitter. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> well, while, uh, while we're at it let's just suggest a few players to Ziliakis as well yeah if you could go out and sign this intriguing young prospect who's playing in England named Holland I would appreciate it I heard the Zimbabwe think, guy's pretty decent I think uh, I think someone like uh, what's that defender's name Pablo Mari from Monza is more up Ziliakis' budget than you know, <laughs> than, than Mbappe so well, that that's probably true. <laughs> Maybe I thought cheeky. you were going to suggest Liao. I was just thinking that. Maybe a cheeky bid for Liao, you know? <laughs> save, <laughs> save on relocation costs, you know? He won't even have to move. He can just pick up, you know? He doesn't have to, he can go to the same stadium. Uh, All right. Okay, well, I think that's a wrap for this week's episode. Appreciate everyone listening. We'll be back next week to recap the Salzburg and Roma matches and hopefully have a couple wins in, on the board so thanks guys appreciate it catch you later see you guys yeah thanks bye